and good evening. It's Wednesday night. It is the 3rd of July, um, which is not a particularly fateful day, although tomorrow will be in the United States of Americania, so I'm told. And if you're in America, have a brilliant day tomorrow. Uh, but tonight, it being Wednesday night, it's VT Talk, a week before the 10th of July. And the 10th of July has got a lot of meaning, hence my guest tonight. Let me run through who's in the various different bits and bobs of monitors for you tonight. In the doghouse, where she usually lives, is the effervescent loveliness, the bountylicious bouncing... No, it's all gone wrong. I, I should have practised that one before. Yeah, it should. Yeah, it's Sav in, in the doghouse. Hi, Sav. How are you doing? I'm fine. How's yourself? I'm walking about and breathing, barely. That's good. But I still have all my fingers. Brilliant. Well, the reasons for that will become clearer tomorrow. But in the big monitor, in the guest monitor, in the comfortable suite, in the presidential suite, we have one of, well, you're the godfather of harm reduction, aren't you? It's Professor yeah. Jerry Stimson, who many of you will recognise, who is, as I've said, the godfather of harm reduction. He's the man who has strange ideas like taking a whole load of vapours across to Brussels <laughs> to, <laughs> to protest. How are you doing, Jerry? I'm fine. I'm fine, David. And hello, everybody. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to boarding the vapour train to Brussels on the 10th. Yes, it, it has been dubbed the vapour train. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. I'm, I'm toying with the idea of uh, getting somebody to write a funky tune. <laughs> because it, it sounds as though it ought to have a funky tune to be on the vapour train. Um, but we'll talk about that right after the titles, after I say hello. Good evening and welcome to VT Talk. Live. And here we are, VT Talk proper. Um, Sav, just in case you are new to the show, is in charge of scraping chat to discover what you've all been saying. So any questions that you might have, any comments that you want to make, type them into chat. Sav picks them up, she collates them, she types them up, well, copies and pastes, and then lets us know what's been going on. Um, because if you've ever watched the Here's Hour, you know what it's like. If I watch chat, there is no show. I just sit and watch chat. But let's 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 get straight into it. Jerry, you came up with this uh, with this idea for the protest in Brussels, but I know we've been talking about it behind the scenes. Um, press, it's all about getting pub. Well, tell everybody why we're doing this. We've still got everything to gain. Um, the voting. Well, we're going to it in a minute, but. Uh, there's still a lot of doubt about who's going to win this game in terms of uh, whether and, or, or not e-cigarettes are in the tobacco um, products directive. So right up until the brink, because the vote is actually going to be, or they're, they're going to start the session for the vote on the 10th at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It may be concluded that day, it may go on to the 11th, but we'll be there at midday uh, on the 10th in Brussels. Uh, lots of people coming from, well, you can tell me more about who's coming, but I'm guaranteed we're going to have lots of vapours there. And it's all about getting publicity about the, the madness of having e-cigarettes in the tobacco products directed. So it's all about getting good news stories. And uh, there are lots of nice things planned for that day. Uh, but in the lead up to it, we've got to get as much publicity as we can. I'll come back to that in a minute. Indeed, indeed. And, and of course, um, because the vote happens on the 10th, uh, it's quite important, I think, that everybody now rewrites to every MEP they've ever written to and every MP they've ever written to, uh, because this is a dual process, of course. It, it's not just the Envy Committee and the plenary session of the Parliament. It's also the Council of Ministers, isn't it? It is, and uh, it, it's going to the brink. So all the good work that people did, writing to MEPs, tweeting, writing to MPs, that needs to be geared up again. You know, it's got a little bit quiet, but the next few days are going to be crucial because there's going to be a lot of horse trading going on in Brussels. 
uh, people adopting different positions, trading off one bit of the uh, directive against another. So all the publicity you can get, all the pressure you can bring to bear on your MEPs, the better. I mean, there's more things we've got to do after this because there's still the council and then there's other things going on in the UK. But really the next, I mean, it's this week. It, it's between now and the end of the week to get, uh, you know, to start writing to your, ME, your MEPs again while they are discussing this in Brussels. Yeah, well, you, you were saying earlier on that... Uh you'd had a chat with Clive Bates and that the options that we thought were on the table aren't on the table anymore. So can, can you fill us in on that? Yeah, well, I've been going through the, uh, the, the consolidated amendments with Clive, trying to make sense of what's happened. Uh, McCavern's 1250 amendment, that's gone. Uh, just before I go on to E6, there's no change on SNUS, that's still banned. Bah. Novel tobacco products, and this is important because it covers other nicotine containing products or other ways of delivering uh, tobacco. Um, it's a notification regime rather than authorization. Now we haven't talked about those things and they're not you know, too relevant to, tonight. But to come on to the amendments or the different positions on e-cigarettes, it comes down to three different positions. You've got the original commission proposal, mm -hmm. which is everything above the minimum level needs to be dealt with uh, under medicines regulation. So that's still there as the original proposal proposed by the commission. Mm -hmm. The second is the amendment which is proposed now by McCavern, uh, mainly the, the, the Socialists and the Greens. McCavern's new amendment is everything, all nicotine-containing products have to be treated as medicines. No okay. minimum level. So she's retreated from that, um, from, she called it the simplified procedure, but it wasn't really, but she's come back really to a harder position than even the, the commission has because, uh, you know, it says all nicotine-containing products may only be placed on the market if they are authorised pursuant to directive, blah, 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 and it's the, the medicines directive. There's a third amendment, which is, uh, people may not be familiar with different, different groupings, but there's the ALDI grouping, which is the Lib Dems, there's the ECR grouping, which is the Conservatives. So that's the, the, the sort of Rebecca Taylor, Chris Davis, Cullinan, and they've proposed something which is really very much saying leave as is that nicotine products, um, if there's a claim for treating or preventing disease, they go through medicines, which is fair enough, but otherwise uh, they have to conform with um, existing legislation within the European Union. So that's really going down saying treat them as consumer products. Now, there are a few ifs and buts in that, and the wording is a little bit complicated, but that is a really good, weak position. Uh, the only downside to that is that they include a ban on flavours, which is a bit of nonsense. But um, the, the, that amendment, that's the third one, is really the closest that we're going to get to leaving things as they are, with a period for review later on. Now... Um, there's going to be a lot of politicking going on, but really it's come down to three, well, it's almost two positions, because you've got the original commission one and you've got the cabin one, which are very close, versus this one which says treat them under the normal uh, EU legislation. Yes, it, it's, I must admit it, uh, it took me a little bit by surprise that having made all of the movement that she had, McCavan's backtracked and it looks as though Wilmot has cracked the whip as being the leader of the uh, the Socialist or the Labour Party at any rate in Europe and uh, has brought McCavan into line, which is a little annoying. But I would imagine uh, the chat has a fair bit to say about this. Am I right? <laughs> yes, chat has got an awful lot to say. I had a few lovely comments that came in beforehand, so I'll, I'll deal with them first. Um, like Infurious said, the 10th of July, the day when history is written, 
the day when we vapors came out and directly addressed our oppressors. Mm -hmm. And Tasmaniac has said 10th of July is our Independence Day. And Gary um. Dibley, interesting fact, has said, Did you know that the 10th of July, Lady Godiva rides naked on horseback to force her husband, the Earl of Mercia, to lower taxes? So who's going to Brussels naked? Well, I think that may have been an offer from Gary. I th are you not doing that, like? I couldn't find a horse. Oh, never mind. I'll, uh, I'll have a word with the people on the ground in Brussels and see if we can find a white charger for you to sit upon. <laughs> that might stop me from getting arrested. Uh, and why, so I'll get arrested instead. <laughs> <laughs> but regarding what you've just been talking about, Mark Shaw has said it's great news regarding 1250. Um, but uh, Cerulean C. Lorian has said, well, that's one heck of a change, what um, Linda McCavan is now suggesting. Yep. Mark Shaw also said, well, she has shown um, what she wanted all along now. And Linda has played a game all along, didn't expect anything else, to be honest. Uh, Lorian also said she has quietly changed her stance to sit with Wilmot. Mm -hmm. And I can furious ask, so does this mean the licensed nicotine-containing product is now out? No, it doesn't. Um, if, I, if I read it right, and I hope you don't mind me jumping in here, Jerry, that the licensed nicotine-containing product is exactly what they're talking about, the, the medicines. It's a medicines license. Yes. And what that effectively means, in, certainly in terms of the UK and very probably right the way throughout, throughout Europe, is that it will have to undergo clinical trials. Um, there is no way, because of the nature of the beast, that any of the regulatory authorities are going to, are going to allow these things to go through without trials. The bottom line on it is, it seems to me, they just don't want them there. So effectively, making e-cigs medicines is a, what, what they call a de facto ban. It's not a ban per se where they've written we're going to ban them. It's a ban in that nobody will be able to achieve the criteria that they set out for medicinal regulation. We, and we know in the UK, Jeremy Mean has already said there is nothing on the market today that would qualify for a medicines license. That being the case, everything that you know would disappear from the shelves. Now, we also know that there's going to be court cases that will take place, that we're absolutely sure of. What we don't know is whether the UK law allows, and Jerry, you might know something about this, because I don't know whether the UK law allows an injunction that stops them from seizing goods and what have you, because apparently in Hungary over the last week, they've basically banned e-cigs and they've seized thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds worth of e-liquid. Um, so do, do you know, Jerry, whether UK law would allow seizure if they decide, or would it allow um, an injunction against seizure should this all go pear-shaped? I, I don't know, and I think that's jumping quite a way ahead because I don't think it's quite as clear as you indicated. The thing about the NHRA is we were expecting them to come out with a clear statement about what this uh, light touch or right touch regulation might be, but it wasn't actually there in the NHRA statement. And I think they've been, I have no evidence for this, my, my guess is that they've been sat on a bit by the Department of Health saying you can't actually say how you're going to regulate these things until we've heard what's happening in Brussels. Mm. And the MHRA position is very much contingent on what happens in Brussels. Now, if if the vote goes our way, then MHRA has to rethink because they've linked their fortune to, they're saying they're doing this in line with what will happen in Brussels. The second thing is MHRA has said it'll be coming in in well, 2016, but if you look at some of the council papers, there's still this window. So products coming on the market in 2016 will still be allowed to exist for another couple of years or so. So mm. it's it's quite an extended period. So that's one thing. It's not all set in stone. The other, I know, you know we talk about bans, but there will be products available, but it's what the market will, or the, the products will dramatically change and who is producing them, because there will be companies which will apply, as we know, they are applying 
for licensing under medicine regulation now. So this actually gives an advantage to some of the bigger players. And uh, when MHRA uh, press release came out, uh, British American Tobacco gave a cautious welcome, you know, because we know that they've got two products going through. Um, some of the other big distributors know that they can afford to go through the medicines licensing process. And it, it actually won't, in, it, it probably won't need clinical trials, but it will need a lot of documentation, but it won't need new, new, new trials. So it would be a big shake up and a push towards you know, products from larger manufacturers, standardized products, and you'll get the smaller uh, um, uh, players being being pushed out, and the, the DIY, the um, you know the the sort of things you like using will begin to disappear. So it's not a total ban, but it's a, it, in my view, in five, if this goes through, in sort of, sort of three four years, you'd have a reshaping of the market. Who are the big players and what the products are? So it, there's a nuance to it. It's going to change if all this goes through, and it's not a good change because. There are lots of downsides to Medzareg, which we, we could go through, uh, but uh, uh, there will be products there, but there'll be different products. Yes, I mean, my understanding is that Enjoy uh, has jumped on the bandwagon, as have Nicolites. Yes. And uh, there are one or two others as well. Um, Gamucci is another one that's welcoming regulation. Um, well, this is not unusual for you know some companies actually like regulation because it gives them a better, you know, a, a secure corner of the market. You know, yeah. it helps them if not monopolise the market, but it gives them a you know regulation is used to give them a market advantage. So um, you know that's a downside. I mean, there are lots of other downsides as, as well. Um, I mean, uh, the uns sorry to go on a bit, but the uncertainty caused by the MHRA announcement <coughs> has meant that some um, retailers are now refusing to stop E6 because they're, you know, they, they've taken legal advice and say it's too dodgy until we know what's going to happen. That's that's you know that's such an unfortunate thing <coughs> um, because all right, I, I mean I I don't travel about an awful lot, but everywhere I've been over the last four or five weeks, whenever we've stopped anywhere to get diesel. Um, Every garage I've been into has had a display of e-cigs there. Our corner shop has e-cigs. My local little, you know, one of these Tesco Express jobs has yeah. e-cigs. There's e-cigs just about everywhere you look. And the fact that what's happening now has already started to, to make the market smaller, to make their availability less, it's got to point out to the people in Brussels exactly what their actions yes. are going to uh, have. Yeah. They're already preventing people from getting them. Yeah. It, it, and it annoys me intensely. And I can see Sav clattering away, so I know Chat's got something to say. Oh, Chat, I've got an awful lot to say. Okay. I will rattle through what I've got. Um, from a new member in Chat, John Lonsdale has said, Wilmot and McCavan should be taken from Brussels straight to The Hague for crimes against humanity for this. Gillis has said, if, if they have removed the minimum nicotine level, then is it any product containing any level of nicotine that will need medical licensing? My feeling is that that will be the case, and they will say that there's a margin of error, and because they've found nicotine in supposedly nicotine-free juices, everything's caught. I just have the feeling that's what they'll do. Yeah, funny trickster has said, basically they want us to go back to tobacco and pay taxes and die, then they'll treat us like lepers. Well, I guess before we die, they'll treat us like lepers. Well, that's certainly the case in Italy, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, Pie Boys said, trial, aren't we enough of a trial for them? Some of us have been vaping for many years and I do believe that we are fine. Mark Shaw has said, as I've said all along, there are people out there who are supposed to be anti-smoke and who do very well out of smokers in one way or another, and they see e-cigs as a threat to their existence. Clive Bates said as much in one of his blogs recently also. Gillis has also said, if you state all nicotine products, then surely it must mean all, including things like cigarettes, tomatoes, all those things. Lazy Vapor has said, they will either force us to an early death or to be criminals. And Big Craig has said, it's the hypocrisy of it all that annoys me more than anything. And yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that, Craig. 
Um, there's a question I want to ask you, Jerry, when we come back from the adverts, and this thing about it's, it's this thing about all nicotine-containing products. Um, but we'll take a short break, and when we come back, I'm going to fire this one in because it's it it's bugged me for donkey's ages. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with Jerry Stimson, Sav, and myself straight after these messages. And we're back, uh, back here on VT Talk with Professor Jerry Stimson, Sav in the doghouse and, and I'm in the doghouse as well, but for all sorts of other reasons. I might have had a few too many drinks yesterday celebrating a once in a year thing. Sav, were you going to say something? Me? Not at all. I wasn't going to say a word. Okay, that's fine. Right, Jerry, this question I've got that I, I, I really do feel the need to, to ask because I just don't understand why in all of this, why are cigarettes, tobacco cigarettes, ring fenced? They're talking about nicotine containing products, they're talking about snus. Why are they ring fencing tobacco? Well, they're not treating all these products in the same way. I mean, they are coming down very heavily on tobacco. Uh, there is something, I can't find it right now, but it says that all the makers of cigarettes or smoking tobacco will be responsible for all the health costs and consequences. So they are coming down heavily, but they're not treating all these different products within one single regulatory framework. Uh, I think it's really that if you've got something that looks a bit like a medicine, you know, it's kind of a liquid and, you know, whatever, you, you can immediately reach for a medicines regulatory framework, but with tobacco, you're not quite. You know, it's, it, there's not really an existing framework for doing anything as tough with it as many people would like. I mean, you've got all the controls you can put over advertising, sales, cross-border sales. <coughs> you know, all, all those things that are in the uh, in the directive. But it is, you know, we are they are treating these products in, in very different ways. I mean, there was this thing about novel tobacco products, which includes like the heat not burn, uh, things like that, which are in, 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 you know, are under development. And they were going to put those through an authorization procedure. So you're making it harder. Well, they're not now, but it's just going to be a notification procedure. You're making it harder to get the things which are safer. And that's just a bizarre, you know, just bizarre, you know, because the toughest controls need to be on the hardest um, products. I'm actually doing a little bit of work with, um, there's a guy called David Nutt, who's well known for his work on uh, ranking 
different drugs, and he, 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 he was an advisor to the government on drugs, and he did this harm index, you know, where do things really sit in the big scheme of things, alcohol, tobacco, heroin, cannabis, and all the rest of it, and I persuaded him to do something soon on tobacco-containing products, nicotine-containing, so do a risk analysis, the, the spectrum of risk, so that's pushing towards seeing how these things rank. It's still a long way to having rules which are proportionate to the risks and harms. You know, we've got it all the wrong way around at the moment because making it harder on the safer products, which is just madness. Well, th th this is the bit that, especially today, when CAT has been banned in the UK. You know, it, it, if, yes. if people aren't <laughs> aware of what CAT is, I mean, it, it's, not, uh, it's not a particularly common substance. It's, it, it's a plant. It grows as a plant. They chew it, and it, it, it has a similar sort of effect, I think, to kind of caffeine on steroids. I've never used it myself. Um, but that's being banned. And you have to wonder why, if they're going to ban cat, I, I just don't understand why they don't just come straight out and say, right, we're going to ban tobacco. There's got to be a reason for this. Yeah. Yeah. There, there, there cannot be any sense in making it more difficult to get your hands on something that's a thousand times less risky than smoke tobacco than it is to get cigarettes to go and smoke. As I said, yeah. you know, as, as Jerry said, we're, we're talking about a situation where retailers are stopping selling electronic cigarettes because of what the MHRA announcement was. That's making it more difficult to get them. Yet you can still go to probably the same shops and buy a pack of 20 Marlies. Other cancerous causing devices also exist. Sorry, Jerry, I jumped in on you there. Yeah, no, I think partly it is the size of the established markets because you've got a huge market for cigarettes. And we know you know, lots of ways in trying to persuade people not to smoke cigarettes, and one of them is through taxation. Well, you can only do that, you know, so far because of the around 10, 12% of cigarettes on the market are outside of the, um, you know, the taxation system. They are, you know, they're, they're smuggled in, they're brought in for personal use, or they are fake cigarettes. So the more you bang up the price, it, you know, the, the, the more you get these, the, these un, unintended consequences. And really the size of the cigarette market is such that you can't move to ban in, in, in that way. Cat, not a matter, small groups, you know, East Africans, um, it, it looks good for the government to say we banned another thing. Although, you know, CAT, which is K-H-A-T, for everybody, um, it's a plant, it's quite hard work to get anything enjoyment out, but you have to chew it, you chew it with something else in your mouth, you know, to, to make it work. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's clearly, you know, even the government's advisory council on emissions of drugs says don't ban it because there's not really a problem here. But, you know, there are people who like banning things and there are people who like making a lot of uh, noise about banning things. Um, mm. It's just a, a pity that e-cigarettes are not pushing us towards a new way of regulating products uh, in, in, a, in a small r, you know, uh, product improvement, you know, making sure they're safe and all the rest of it. Mm. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's going to happen again and again. I mean, we, we've got e-cigarettes, but I mean, I'm interested in this partly because it's sooner or later you've got to face the problem of how you regulate illicit drugs. And, you know, we need to be looking at new, smaller regulatory models uh, and not the sort of sledgehammer MHRA type models. Well, I would agree with you there. Um, I, I think caffeine's probably going to be next on their list, I've got to be honest. <laughs> The way they're going, honestly. It, it, but talking about that and, and how, you know, there's horse trading going on, there is horse trading going on in the European Parliament at the moment, is there not? There is. Um, I mean, the key group, apparently, is, is the, the, what's called the EPP, which is the centre-right conservative bloc, I think, although I never quite know how to describe these groupings, of which Germany is very important. Now, they have a sort of an affinity with the Aldi group, that's the Lib Dems, and they are wavering at the moment, and it's also unclear what the, the French position might be. So, you know, contacts with vapors in Germany, keeping up the pressure on MEPs there is going to be good. Now, the horse trading, 
Uh, I mean, I just get wind that there are two key things going on, one, uh, and one is more important than the other. One is the plain, the so-called plain packs, rather a wrong term, but you know the the packs with um, graphic images. That is really the centerpiece of the tobacco products directive, and they want to get that through at all costs. So there might be a bit of horse trading around Article 18, the the um, nicotine containing products directive and the plain packs one that you know the, the, the people may give way on article 18 in order to get the the plain packs run through because they're desperate to get this through before the end of this um, parliament in 2014 so it'll come down to political horse trading in the corridors at brussels so that's that's the win that i that's the, the what i get at the moment but still there's a lot to play for and you know as i say the event in Brussels, everybody, you know, people going on the vapor train is important. As to writing to people, writing to MEPs, as to getting stuff in your local paper, because your MEP wants to get re-elected. So, if you're coming from Bolton to Brussels or from Huddersfield to Brussels, you go along tomorrow to your local newspaper. You write, you've still got time to get it in. Probably going to be published before next Tuesday. Wonderful story. Here we are. We're taking a day off work. We're going to Brussels. This is, you know, affects our lives. It's a, you know, a key issue for us, and you know, it's a great local interest story. So it's not just the big media stuff, but it's getting it to the local press because MEPs are very sensitive to what their constituents are saying. Absolutely, and I, and I have seen on Twitter um, that people are now inviting their local MEP to come along to the uh, Brussels balloon job. And, and even take a balloon and, and pop a balloon. And yes, please invite your local MEP sort of do. I've, I've written now to, I think, 60 of them. Um, I think Rebecca Taylor is going to join us. I hope Chris Davis is going to join us. I've had uh, an email today from Denmark asking whether it's all right for one of the Danish MEPs to come and join us. Uh, and if you were watching DE Talk last night, um, the guys on there, Mark and Thomas and Norbert, are inviting Matthias Grüter, who is the chairman of the Envy Committee, to come along and join us. And I think he probably will. Um, I've also heard today that the BBC television cameras are going to be there. Um, and I've also briefed um, someone uh, to, to help us out with the media and, and get it spread all over the world. So yes, get on your MEP. If you're going, let them know. If you can't go, Get on your newspaper and tell them that you would love to have been there. But this is going on and this is to save lives because e-cigs save lives. There's something else happening though after the 10th, is there not, Jerry? Yes, um, we've got a meeting in Parliament uh, the next morning, 8.30 on, the, on Thursday morning. Uh, a parliamentary briefing organised by Lord Hutton of oh, Furness. Mm. And the idea of that meeting is to talk with parliamentarians, MPs and Lords about what's happening in Europe and what's happening with the MHRA. Because we think that many MPs, many Lords, don't know what is happening and the implications of it. So these parliamentary briefings, I mean, you're, you're lucky if you get maybe six or eight or ten along, so it's not going to be dozens there. But I've been to lots of these in the past on different topics, and you, you, you actually begin to win over, you know, you gain their interest and you, 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 you win them over. So we think that Jeremy Mean will be there from MHRA, and this is an opportunity to put some polite um, you know, points to him. Uh, are we there? Uh, Peter Hayek, uh, who's a, a clinical psychologist, uh, will be there. Possibly Lynn Dawkins, who's um, an e-cigarette researcher from uh, University of East London. And, uh, and of course, um, David. So it should be fun. We all have about five minutes to say something and then it'll be up to the MPs and the Lords to, uh, to ask questions and so on. So it's just another little thing that's... Um, that, yeah, everything helps. 
you know, you just keep on at this all the time. Indeed, and, and I, I really, really do hope that Jeremy Mean is there, uh, because I've got some questions for him, as I'm sure you have, Jerry. I certainly have. I mean, I think one of the dark things is that there's never been a clear options appraisal about how you best regulate and improve products. I mean, giving it to MHRA is a little bit like going to, you know, you've got a health problem, you go to a surgeon, you get an operation, you go to the MHRA, you get medical regulation. I mean, nobody sat, sort of stepped back and said, if we need to do something, for example, if we're concerned about quality, safety, maybe efficacy, and if we think, you know, those things are important, well, how best do we reach those objectives? But all the time you come down to a kind of a, a regulatory controlling framework, whereas I think the starting place should be, but well, actually, how can we persuade more people to use them? You know, that's a different mindset altogether. The tobacco control mindset, and that's why we end up with e-cigarettes in the Tobacco Products Directive. The tobacco control mindset is all about controlling, limiting, restricting. And e-cigarettes don't have a place there. The, the framework is a kind of a cross between a public health and a consumer-driven framework. People want to use them. They, 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 they're good products. How do you get them to more people? So that's the mindset for me that you need to have, not the argument that MHRA and some of the supporters and the advisors have said, well, medicines control will make the products better, they'll work better, more people will use them. But that's yeah, a bit of a nonsense. Yeah, I think it's a lot of a nonsense because judging by everything that I've managed to pick up, and I've, I've picked snip, snippets up here, there and everywhere, they're talking about dose delivery. Yes. And you're going to end up with a leaflet three miles long <laughs> telling you that you should suck on your electronic cigarette uh, no more than once an hour, no more than 15 puffs of no longer than three seconds duration, and please do not hold the vapour in your lung for longer than five seconds. To do so could subject it to 50,000 degrees temperature, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's ludicrous. It the, will, it, yeah. When you open your pack and inside it's got the, the product safety leaflet, you know, as when you get, you know, antibiotics or whatever, you know, it's going to have a whole bunch of stuff there, which is not, you know, it's, it's, just, out, it's just out of place. There. So, um, and, and all this stuff about dose, well, you know, and all these arguments about minimum doses or maximum. We've known for years that people titrate nicotine. If they're smoking, you know, you have lower nicotine levels level cigarettes people puff more you know so people are very adept at reaching the nicotine level they like with the product they want so you know it, it, people know what to do with these things and it, it, it's a nonsense to suggest they need to be told how to use them you're absolutely right Sav, have we uh, have we got anything coming through from chat at this moment in time we have absolutely loads okay through from chat it's all yours I'll take a deep breath and I'll rattle through what I've got. Um, they've been chatting about all sorts that have been getting to them through everything that you've been talking about, so I'll just start at the top. Midge Dog has said, it's all the potential switches I feel for if this goes through. Many of us have a stash and even know how to make our own, but you're denying a life-saving opportunity to so many people if this goes through. Absolutely. Again, Leanna Lawless has said, we may have a bit of a stash, but people are frightened of switching now, even. Yes. Mark Shaw has said, the only worry is, with big players like Enjoy and such siding with MHRA, will there be a rich enough body to fight this in court? Yeah, I can think of two. Mm-hmm. Vaping Viking says, I'm seeing more and more people vaping all the time. Makes me want to print out a leaflet about all of this rubbish to hand to them and make them aware. Pie Boy said, regarding um, heavy handedness on tobacco, he said, Heavy deal heavily with tobacco equals more tax, which does nothing other than put Joe Public out of pocket. Yep. Parrot Flock has said, I know their intention is to force us to quit, but when will they get it through their heads? We don't want to quit. It's our lives, and e cigs are the best options available to us. Mm -hmm. Sooty has said, so what is the point of voting for MEPs and MPs? Once they're elected, they do not listen to us, do not do their research properly or fully, and just do what they want, saying we know what is best for you. That would be the nanny state taking over, yeah. 
Yeah, Adam August says, it's the old story, if they brought tobacco out today it would be banned. They can't ban tobacco because there would be a revolution. They can ban e cigs because it's a newish product to the market and to the majority of people. I bet they wouldn't like 1.3 million of us going down and chanting we don't want them banned. No, definitely not. Um, Laurie says, I agree on the money thing. However, how many other political decisions can you think of which have condemned millions and millions of people to death over many generations? Um, Adam has also said the biggest problem stems, stems from the belief that e-cigs help people quit. Not true. The fact that e-cigs are, are an alternative to cigarettes. Politicians do what they think we need, not what we want. They don't care what we want. And Kronos has said, stay the custard out of my business unless it affects at least one other person. <laughs> well, yeah, yes, yes, that's, yeah. that's, that's very good. Oh, uh, is there more? There's more. There's, there's, there's more. There's more. Yeah. I've got a question for you from <laughs> Lamental who says, Dave, mm -hmm. should or should we not be explaining in letters to MEPs how effective e cigs have been in stopping smoking? Would saying this add more fuel to the fire in their medicines argument? This is, this is an interesting point, um, and it is a very interesting point because there are so many parliamentarians and politicians that think that the word quit means to become nicotine abstinent. We know, because of the way the American uh, contingent uses the word quit, it means stopping lighting tobacco and inhaling it. Now, the idea of writing to your MEPs, MPs, whoever, councillors even, and, and explaining that because we use one of these, we have quit inhaling burning tobacco and therefore have reduced our risk of COPD and lung cancer and esophageal cancer and cancer of the pancreas and God knows what else by three orders of magnitude. If you explain that, then if they get enough of those letters, they might just begin to understand. Some already do. Some already do. I'm here to tell you that Glenis Wilmot definitely doesn't. Although, if you're on Twitter, and you should be, you might have seen some information about the uh, organisations that Glenis Wilmot's been talking to and who they're funded by. But let's not go into that just at the minute. So yes, it's a brilliant idea to write and it's a brilliant idea to explain what we mean by the word quit. We don't mean becoming nicotine abstinent. We mean becoming death abstinent, smoke abstinent. We're not lighting tobacco and inhaling the fumes. That's probably a good point to take the second set of adverts and when we come back we've got a little bit more to talk about because uh, I'm quite excited and I think we've probably got some more to come from chat, haven't we, Sav? We have, yes. Yeah, so when, when we come back from the adverts, we'll take the next lot from chat and uh, I was going to play the Chris Davies video in. I don't know whether we're going to get time. This is all so interesting. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Don't go anywhere.
And we're back on VT Talk here on Wednesday the 3rd of July. I had to look at the date, you know. I couldn't remember it was the 3rd of July. Yesterday was the 2nd, tomorrow's the 4th. Self, I know we had more from you, from your good self. Do tell me what chat is saying, please. Regarding the meeting in the House of Lords, Gordon Allen Beard has said, brilliant, about time to influence Lord Stroke MAPs. Mm -hmm. Mark Shaw has said, can Dave ask Mr Mean one question from him? And that question is, how do you sleep at night? Oh, I'll be asking that. Yeah, um, Gordon's also said, do we know if, if that would be on parliamentary TV? I don't know, Jerry. Do you do you know whether no, it will hit? It, it, it won't be. Uh, it, it's um, it's a parliamentary briefing, so it'll be it, it won't be televised. It'll be a fairly informal uh, meeting where there's a, a sort of full and frank exchange of ideas, but it won't be broadcast. Ah, oh, shame. Back to you, Sav. There was also a question regarding that as well. Would it be open to the public, or is it a closed meeting? It'll be by invitation only. Right. Um, next thing, Parrot Flock has said, as was said in a recent conference, e-cigs are not a smoking cessation product. E-cigs are a smoking sensation product. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, very boring has said. Okay. Sorry. That's um, okay. Mate, right. Very boring has said. Can you post details of the parliamentary briefing in the forum so we can alert our MPs? That's a good idea. Yes. Yeah. That's a good idea. Um. Vaporman says, will there be a live VT talk coming from the EU protest on the 10th? Um, <laughs> do you know, I would love to if I could, um, but I'm going to be so tied up and literally I I've got no idea whether we'd be able to get Wi-Fi signal or anything like that. Just keep your eyes on the BBC News, ITV News, because we've contacted them, Andy Sutton's been there. Um, Keep your eyes on the news. I, I would honestly, given the numbers that I believe are going, um, I don't see how it's not going to make the news. Uh, so keep your eyes on that. And indeed, you know, get on, uh, as Jerry said earlier, get on to all your local news outlets and let them know this is happening. If everybody knows it's happening and they know that there's going to be something newsworthy going on, they're, they're almost on a bound to cover, cover it. And, and I speak as a, an ex-editor, as a journalist. If there's something newsworthy and you miss it, you look a complete custard, a cowardly cowardly custard. Uh, you look a complete plonker if you've missed it. So the, the major stations, if they're made aware it's going on, I don't think they can afford to miss it. Would you agree, Jerry? Yeah, I mean, it's a good story. I mean... You can get sort of national media, but the local media is always about this group going from our town to Brussels. So that's a great story. You know, these five people are going off to Brussels to protest about something that's going to, ch you know, the goes to is going to change their lives and the lives of many other people. So that's a that's a surefire one for the for the for the local media. No no, no doubt about that at all. Absolutely, absolutely right. Um, have we got anything else from chat, Sav? Because I know they will have been very voluble tonight and, and because they are the best chat in the world. They are the most fabulous chat in the world. I've got a final question that came in from Mark Hamburg and it's a question for Jerry. And he says, where do you get all your motivation to work and act like you do? <laughs> I don't know. I'm retired. I've retired a couple of times and I'm sort of working again very busily. Um, I, I, I spent most of my life doing academic research, which was really pretty boring until I discovered there were other things to do. <laughs> then I got into drug harm reduction and was always a bit interested in tobacco. And but since I gave up my last job, which was for an international harm reduction associate, uh, meet, uh, harm, international harm reduction um, organization, you know, I got very into um, tobacco harm reduction. Because it's a no-brainer, you know. There's a huge problem with smoking, and there's there's a clear uh, solution. So you know, I, I, I talk to all sorts of people. I find it really fascinating to just discuss this with all sorts. You know, people from industry, people from public health. I'm a bit of a an unusual person in public health because um, you know I talk to people working in industry, for example, and that's a, you know that's a no-go area for many of my public health colleagues. So, so I just you know just I just see there's so much to be gained here that um, it's just worth kind of uh, going on and on about it to everybody who's able to, to listen. And you meet nice people. 
<laughs> in, in, indeed so. Um, I, I like all of that. Um, I think if you believe in something strongly enough, you get the energy to, to go out and do what you need to do in order to make sure that it happens. Yeah. Um, I certainly from my own point of view a couple of years ago uh you know there was no way would i have seen myself doing what i've been doing this last six months um my, my i thought my days in politics were right at an end uh but this is too important to ignore it's 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 just too important to do nothing yeah i mean you, six months i mean it is amazing because it's, it's this year you know it's really since you know january and there's been a big turnaround, huge interest. Vape has become in vocal, uh, finding you know ways to talk to politicians. It's it's a real kind of historical moment, and we've still got a lot to to, to play for. And having this event in Brussels, which I, you know, Dave, but it's the first international vaping protest ever. I believe that's the case. Yeah. Yes. So that you know historical historical moment and somebody said will it be on on vt talk well there will be somebody filming it so there will be film of the event so uh, be able to catch up later if it's not done that night well yes i mean um i should point out that vt talk next week will be on monday night i'm swapping with gary uh gary's going to do tenure tip on wednesday night because in actual fact we wouldn't really know what the result of the vote, the vote will have been, even if they get it concluded on Wednesday night, because it's all, as you will have seen before, uh, amendment number 47, all in favour, all against, abstentions rejected, 48 in favour, against, abstentions carried, blah, blah, blah. And by the time they roll this all together, we'll, we'll not really know until one of the MEPs that's sitting on the committee tweets and says, ACIGs are medicines, ACIGs aren't medicines, plain packs are in, plain packs are out we're just not going to know so there'll be a vt talk on monday night um where i'm i'm gonna basically talk about what's going to be happening in brussels uh kind of put the dot the i's and cross the t's that kind of thing and and anything else that we need to cover at the time and i'm gonna whip everybody up the right again and tweet again and all of that kind of stuff so you're not getting away with it everybody we need everybody absolutely everybody to get involved we've really 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 got to put the pedal to the metal we've got to get the big hammers out we've really really got to do this now because if we don't it could be too late we can't rely on what i'm quite i'm actually quite optimistic about this and we were talking about it earlier um the jury committee let me just read you one of the footnotes from the jury committee's opinion it says and i'll put it up on screen so you can see it at least i will if the software will work ha <sighs> Do you know what? Technology lets you down every time. Here we go. Right, where are we? Camera four. That's the one. There it is. Point two. Article 18 also lacks a valid legal base as it is in no way aimed at improving the conditions for the establishment and functioning of the internal market. Pursuant to the Commission, the provision will allow NCP to move freely across borders as they would benefit from the mutual recognition procedure under the Medicinal Products Directive Impact Assessment, page 8. However, this is already the case without Article 18, as any NCP which qualifies as a medicinal product is already now subject to the Medicinal Products Directive. The only effect Article 18 has is that it prohibits the placing on the market of NCP that are not authorised pursuant to the Medicinal Products Directive. But the bit before that says, relying on the strict jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the European Union, several national courts have already held that e-cigarettes cannot be qualified as a medicinal product by function under the Medicinal Products Directive. See, for example, Oberverwaltungsgereicht, Nordheim-Westfalen and others that we know about. Now, that's jury. Envy, as I understand it, the committee that's handling all of this, can ignore that. Indeed, I've been told frequently that committees in, in uh, the European Union do. They get legal advice that says, you can't do that. And they go, yeah, we know. And then they get told, but, but you can't do that. Yeah, 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 we know, but we're going to. And that could well be the case here. So they do know that it's not going to be legal to do. So Envy might decide that, well, we're just going to ignore jury. But I am told 
that the plenary session where all of the MPs get together always or nearly always take the opinion of the jury committee and of course why wouldn't they that's what the jury committee is there to do to examine what's going on and say actually lads and lasses you can't do that and that's what they're doing here that's what the jury committee is saying D does that uh, does that give you some some optimism jerry yeah it certainly does i mean I, I i you know we're all learning through this how europe works you know because it's a it's very distant for our day-to-day -day understanding you know so, but yeah uh, when you've got these conflicting views i mean the jury thing saying it actually the fundamental basis of the the european union is kind of free trade and everything has to be based on you know enhancing trade within uh, within the European Union and this doesn't actually they say this doesn't actually fit that model you know you can't justify this in those terms so who wins out at the end of the day I don't know because I don't know enough about you know <laughs> I might know in about six months time but I don't know at the moment whose voice um, counts when you've got conflicting advice from different uh, European Parliament um, committees. One thing to add, of course, is it is not just the Parliament, it is the Council of Ministers, so that means writing to your MPs and getting your MPs to write to the Minister for Health, who is responsible for this, is Anna Subri. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there are complicated procedures. If there's a disagreement between the Council and the Commission and the um, the Parliament, there's a, there's, a, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a way of working out you know, differences of views, but we're focusing a lot on MEPs. Don't give up on MPs. They're important for influencing the council, and of course they're also important for influencing um, MHRA and Department of Health. So there's there's still lots to do. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. There's barrel loads to do, and we need to be doing it. We need to start tonight. We need to be tweeting. We need to be emailing. We need to be writing. Apparently, a handwritten letter works wonders. So, MPs, MEPs, I know I keep on saying it, and I'm going to keep on saying it. Write, 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 write to them. They work for you. Sav, I can see, and I've heard the clicks, you must have a million and five things to tell us. I've got loads and loads and loads, but I'll narrow it down as we're nearly out of time. Um, regarding what you just read from the jury document, Mark Shaw has said, no judge can ignore that. MEPs can. And also said, is anyone keeping an eye on any changes to the law that the EU may try pushing through to cover their behinds? I've been watching the, um, the other stuff that they're doing on medicines and so far nothing impacts. Excellent. Gillis has said, all vendors should be informing customers. All users have to buy from a vendor. Some of our vendors have been brilliant with this. Mm -hmm. And Midge Dog's comment, which should be the last one from chat tonight, I think, is you are the one that can make a difference. There, There's no others that will do it for you. Your own experience means everything. So write to your MEP, MP, and make your voice heard. Midge Dog, you've got it exactly right. From me, plus one. Definitely, without any shadow of a doubt. Jerry, is there anything you want to say to the viewers before we wrap this up? No, it's a pleasure to be on the show and it's just a pleasure to hear everybody so involved with this issue. Thank you. And thank you. Um, I'm going to say thank you. I might not thank you when I finish organising all of this. But yeah, um, people, it's in our hands. It's in your hands. You've heard me say this before. The people that are important in all of this are you and the people like you if we sit and wait for other people to do it for us it's not going to happen we've got to do it for ourselves with that thought from jerry from sav and from me dave dawn i'll see you tomorrow night on the here's hour which is going to be completely off the cuff because i'm wrecked and uh, you know what to do get tweeting get emailing and uh, I'll see you for VT Talk on Monday of next week and tomorrow for the Here's Hour. Good night, everybody. Thanks for watching.